Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I would be grateful for short and succinct questions and indeed answers. Question one, Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made in encouraging businesses to sign up to the Scottish Business Pledge. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunning. Uh, 99 companies, large and small, have made a pledge in the three months since the launch, equivalent roughly to an employer in Scotland signing up every day. Uh, that's a very positive start and signals the growing enthusiasm of the business sector uh, to share the government's vision of an innovative entrepreneurial Scotland that grows in a fair and sustainable way. Campbell. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. She may be aware that I recently corresponded with the government regarding seasonal zero hours contracts being used by a company in St Andrews in my constituency. Can she advise how signing up to the business pledge could be beneficial for small organisations such as this and what is being done to encourage small enterprises to register with the scheme? Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member will probably be aware of the figures that have been released today in respect of the uh, prevalence of zero hours contracts in the UK. 1.9% uh, of people in employment in Scotland are in a zero hours contract, um, and that compares with 2.4% across the whole of the UK. Um, so there are some signs that uh, firms in uh, Scotland are not using them uh, anything like to the same extent. But those zero hours contracts and poor working conditions do effectively motivate employees to find new and better jobs. Uh, and leave those firms who insist on using these forms uh, of employment with high recruitment and retention costs and big productivity challenges. So the business pledge is celebrating Scottish-based companies who want to engage and empower, uh, empower their employees, be exemplars uh, for other uh, workplaces. Um, they recognise how fair work and innovation can make jobs attractive and rewarding, make recruitment easier, lower staff turnover and boost productivity and competitiveness. These are all pluses for businesses. And I would hope everyone in the chamber agreed that this was to be welcomed. Thank you. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. The business pledge quite rightly has at its heart a requirement to pay the living wage. I'm sure we'd all want that to be a meaningful living wage, which isn't taken away by sharp practices such as some restaurant change which have been under fire for creaming off tips from their employees. Uh, th this is something that's received significant attention in recent weeks. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that businesses employing such practices would not be uh, eligible to sign up for the business pledge if it brings their employers down below an effective living wage after such money has been clawed back from them? The, the, the criteria for the business pledge are published uh, on the website and are clear. Uh, they don't go into the detail of issues like that. And, and I will have a look at that question, uh, which I think is a fair one. Um, it, it, it does raise uh, uh, with us the, the possibility that some companies may find loopholes around this. And, uh, uh, equally, from our perspective, the living wage that we are talking about is the true living wage and not any ersatz living wage that might be discussed in another place. Many thanks. Question two, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made in introducing the living wage to public sector workers in Rutherglen. Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, workers in Rutherglen, like those across Scotland, will be benefiting from the substantial progress we are making on the living wage. In the local area, South Lanarkshire Council and NHS Lanarkshire pay the living wage to nearly 27,000 employees in total. As Peter Kelly, Director of the Poverty Alliance, has highlighted, Scotland now has the highest public awareness of the living wage and has a faster rate in terms of growth of number of accredited living wage employers than any other part uh, of the UK. Uh, and I would uh, uh, commend accreditation uh, to all employers, whether in Rutherglen or anywhere else. Thank you. James Kelly. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that payment of the living wage in both the public and the private sector uh, brings benefits in terms of motivating and retaining staff? Uh, and does the Cabinet Secretary support my call for the soon to be open McDonald's restaurant in Rutherglen to ensure that all the staff are paid the living wage, ensuring that they are rewarded adequately and also uh, Giving the, giving the McDonald's business uh, a bonus of motivated staff and staff that are more likely to continue working for the company. 
I, I would wholeheartedly join with the member in making that call, uh, not just for McDonald's, but for every employer. Um, the member will have heard my response uh, to uh, uh, Roderick Campbell in respect of the big benefits there are if employers set about paying the living wage and introducing uh, proper fair work practices. Uh, they reduce recruitment, uh, they get better morale, better productivity, uh, and an all-round far better workplace atmosphere uh, which, as I said, Presiding Officer, is something that we would all want. Christina McKelvey. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary her views on the Chancellor George Osborne's appropriating the language of the living wage for what is effectively a supplement to the national minimum wage? The, the member may have heard my use of the word ersatz in response to Patrick Harvey. She may have jumped to the conclusion that that was precisely what I was referring to. Uh, indeed, it is. Obviously, we're going to welcome any rise in the national minimum wage, uh, but what is being proposed is not a living wage, uh, which uh, ought to be calculated according to the basic cost of living and therefore taking into account the adequacy of household incomes for achieving an acceptable minimum living standard. And uh, uh, frankly, what is being proposed, regardless of what it's called, is not a true living wage. Many thanks. Uh, question three, Paul Martin. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what steps have been taken to tackle youth unemployment in Glasgow Province. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, President Officer. This Government has invested in a wide range of employment initiatives which are directly helping to create sustainable employment opportunities for young people in Scotland, including in Glasgow Province. These include Modern Apprenticeships, Community Jobs Scotland and the Youth Employment Scotland Fund. Opportunities for All is the Scottish Government's commitment to an offer of a place in education or training for all 16 to 19 year olds to ensure that all young people develop the skills they need to progress into employment. Thank you very much. Paul Martin. Presiding officer, many of the, and I welcome the Minister's response, but can I make uh, the point that many of the challenges that my young constituents face is actually being provided with the financial support to get into work in the first place, in particular in relation to travel. Uh, I just wonder if the Minister can be specific in what financial assistance is provided to those 16 to 19 year olds. Minister. Um, well, uh, as I did say to the member, there are a number of initiatives. Uh, uh, one of them, of course, he'll be aware of is the Glasgow Guarantee delivered by Jobs and Business Glasgow, which provides every young person in Glasgow with support uh, in the form of an apprenticeship training and work. And it also provides financial support to help businesses grow. Uh, and Glasgow City Council currently benefits, benefits from a range of funding from the Scottish Government to help local people into employment and to support economic uh, recovery. Uh, on the issue of travel, uh, uh, obviously there are uh, some options for young people and I'm happy to write to the member to uh, detail uh, those uh, further. I would say, just in conclusion, presiding officer, that of course uh, we are making progress with respect to tackling youth unemployment, but if there is more to do. Uh, that is why we are investing £16 million this year uh, in implementing our youth employment strategy. Uh, and of course the progress we are seeing can be uh, uh, illustrated by the most recent uh, labour market statistics where we see the highest levels of youth employment uh, uh, since the period April to June 2005 and the lowest levels of youth unemployment uh, since April, June 2008. So we are making progress, but we recognise that there is more to do. Many thanks. Question four, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Youth Employment Scotland Fund. The Secretary, Rosanna uh, Following the launch of the Youth Employment Scotland Fund in June 2013, this Government has allocated up to 10,000 employer recruitment placements to local authorities. Further to the update I provided to Mr Brown on 24th of June by letter, uh, we have recently commissioned an evaluation of the programme and it is envisaged that the report will be available this autumn. Gavin Brown. Grateful for that answer. Um, so 10,000 placements were funded over a two-year period. Approximately to the nearest 1,000, how many of those 10,000 are still in employment? Say. Well, I don't have the figure for the number who are currently still in employment. We've one of the reasons we're doing a current evaluation is that there are some issues around how this, uh, uh, how this fund has been working, uh, not least of which we've discovered that a number of employers who have taken on individuals on this scheme have then not claimed the money for the wages, which then does not entitle them to be counted as part of the scheme. So we are, that's what we're currently evaluating, that particular position at the moment. 
Um, and, uh, of course, the uh, member will be aware that we've brought in a new employer recruitment initiative to deal with what was seen as some of the inflexibilities and uh, bureaucracy around the original uh, programme. Uh, so, uh, the, the precise figures that, uh, uh, um, that Gavin Brown is looking for are not available at present. Um, one of the issues around that, of course, is it's up to local authorities to, 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 to deal with this. Um, and I, I see the sceptical look on his face, but when we're being accused of being in Stalinist control of everything in Scotland, I'm always slightly amused when we're being attacked for not being in Stalinist control enough. Many thanks. Uh, supplementary from Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary uh, how the number of young people in work or employment in Scotland compares to the rest of Europe? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I think as was kind of uh, uh, marginally referred to by my uh, colleague earlier, um, we are doing extremely well in terms of youth employment in uh, Scotland. Uh, in quarter one in 2015, Scotland had the third highest youth employment rate of the EU 28 countries at 54.3%. Only Denmark and the Netherlands had higher youth employment rates than Scotland. Um, the youth employment rate for the UK in quarter one was 47.8%. So that was 47.8% for the UK, 54.3% um, for Scotland. Thank you. John Penland. Since the fund was extended to people aged 25 to 30, how many uh, have been helped in total and in targeted groups such as working mothers, care leavers and disabled people? Well, I'll, I'll need to get back to John Pentland on the specific figures that he's, he, he is uh, asking for in respect of that. Uh, they would need to be ingathered from all of the councils that are currently uh, dealing with this programme. Thanks. Question five, Jenny Mar to ask the Scottish Government, in light of the recommendation by the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce, how many secondary schools in Dundee are paired with an employer? The Secretary. Scottish Government doesn't collate this information, but we know there are good examples of partnerships between secondary schools and employers in Dundee. Uh, for example, Michelin's work with Brave U Academy, which I expect uh, Jenny Mara is already aware of. As part of developing the young workforce, we're making good progress in developing the infrastructure to encourage and support partnerships between schools and employers. DYW regional groups are being established across the country and D Dundee is part of this process. We've produced guidance for school employer partnerships with input from employers and that's going to be available uh, in September, later this month. Jenny Mara. I thank the Minister for her answer. It is of slight concern to me that if her uh, ministry is putting so much effort into uh, creating these guidelines and support for schools and employers pairing up that she hasn't sought that information from Dundee City Council about how successful this has been so far. We are now a year into the Woods Commission. The partnership between Michelin and Brave U predated uh, the Woods recommendations and I would urge uh, the, the, the Minister um, to, to really find out whether um, her efforts efforts in this area are actually bearing fruit on the ground in terms of school and employer partnerships. What support, Minister, is actually available for schools in areas of high deprivation and low employment to pair with employers where they may not be as ready or available to engage with the Wood Commission process? Well, I yeah. indicated in my initial answer that there are DYW groups that are being uh, rolled out across the country and there is one which is currently being discussed for Dundee and Angus. Uh, they are employer-led groups that will be uh, specifically looking at the local jobs market and that will include uh, the issues that uh, uh, the member is raising. Uh, I don't have a precise date for the Dundee and Angus regional group being uh, brought uh, on stream. Uh, it will be this year, uh, but it is being currently discussed and uh, I would hope that the member uh, would engage directly with that group when it, it is announced. Many thanks. Question six, Annabel Goldie. To um, ask the Scottish Government, in light of Recommendation 12 of the Report of the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce, what progress it is making in ensuring that there is a focus on STEM subjects to help young people into employment. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, we are making uh, excellent progress with our Developing the Young Workforce programme, and I am encouraged by the focus on STEM that is emerging on the ground in colleges and in schools. We have seen increases in the number of science, maths and engineering full-time equivalent students in our colleges since 
Uh, developing the young workforce reinforces the priority that colleges have long placed on responding to the need for STEM courses in their uh, various regions. Um, interest and attainment in STEM subjects at school remains healthy. Uh, maths, uh, chemistry and biology are amongst the most popular subjects at higher, being in the top six, uh, uh, with physics only shortly behind. Uh, meanwhile, Education Scotland and the Scottish Schools Education Research Centre provide a strong package of support for STEM in schools. Uh, and the member may wish to be aware that the first annual report on the Developing the Young Workforce Progress is due to be published uh, later in the year when we will have a parliamentary debate. Many thanks. Anna will go on it. That is all very uh, fine, but the Minister will be aware that despite the overall increase in entries to hire this year, there was a 4% reduction in entries to STEM subjects, including maths, biology, chemistry, physics and computing science. Surely this will hamper progress uh, of the youth employment strategy. Surely it will reduce opportunities in STEM careers for young people. And if training opportunities are not improved rapidly, then potentially damage the huge economic contribution these industries make to Scotland. Minister. Uh, well, I, I would also uh, say to the member that if we look at the overall picture since 2007, there has in fact been a 12% increase uh, in the numbers of entries to STEM hires and a 15% rise in numbers of passes over uh, the same period. Uh, in terms of uh, going forward with our uh, seven-year youth employment strategy, uh, having taken up all the recommendations of Sir Ian Wood, uh, I would uh, say to the member that a, 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 an activity, a focus of activity is taking place in our schools uh, and uh, also in our colleges. Uh, and we will uh, ensure through our regular monitoring and our annual progress reports that the progress that we all wish to see that we recognise uh, and as the member does is so important for the future of our, our economy is in fact uh, taking place at the rate that we foresee. Many thanks. Question 7, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its strategy for supporting access to work for disabled people. Mr Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, uh, it is the Scottish Government's ambition that people with disabilities who can and want to progress towards and move into mainstream employment do this. We are very clear on that. We want everyone, including disabled people, to get fulfilling jobs suitable uh, to their skills. Uh, to that end, we provide a variety of different support, for example, through the uh, supported employment model, by helping supported businesses, and by working to ensure that general employment services which are offered are flexible and integrated to support individuals with particular needs. As we look to the devolution of employment support services, uh, what we will uh, ensure that we do is that we will have a more people-centred approach with a focus on individual needs uh, rather than the situation which pertains at present with respect to both the work programme and work choice. Many thanks. James Donald. I thank the Minister for that answer. She'll be aware that I had the pleasure of hosting the first intern, Katrina Johnson, uh, in the Inclusion Scotland internship in the Parliament, uh, which a number of my colleagues later on in, uh, get involved in as well. It was clear from this experience that the way to help disabled people into work is to offer support and flexibility. Does the Minister agree with me that these values should be at the heart of our welfare system rather than the heartless and punitive reforms that Ian Duncan Smith is looking to introduce? which will no doubt add additional anxiety and stress onto those the welfare system is designed to help and not hamper. Minister. Um, I was uh, I, I very pleased indeed to be able to attend, albeit briefly, the uh, reception that the member had to celebrate the success of the cross-party internship for young uh, disabled graduates uh, programme. And I commend him and all those involved uh, on the uh, uh, assistance they provided with respect to that. In terms of the current support and employment model, uh, it is a person-centred approach and it identifies what the individual wants to do and can do, and this is at the heart of the support provided. We will continue to support and promote this evidence-based model, which supports uh, people with disability into employment. Uh, we are clear that we will take these uh, fundamental principles uh, into our planning for the devolved employment support services. And I would say, in conclusion, presiding officer, that there is no place, no place, for the inhumane policies of Ian Duncan Smith in the Scotland that we on these benches wish to see. Briefly, John Lamont. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Minister will be aware that around 8% of the population has a disability, but only around 1% of people entering an apprenticeship have a dis disability. This proportion is far lower than in other parts of the United Kingdom. What will the Cabinet Secretary, sorry, what will the Minister do to address barriers to access to apprenticeships for disabled people in Scotland? Minister. Uh, yes, I, I, I do agree that there is uh, uh, more work to be done and we are determined uh, to do it. Uh, what I would say to the member is, and I think the member may be aware in terms of previous debates in the chamber, 
that uh, Skills Development Scotland is currently working on the Equalities Action Plan uh, that we had uh, discussed and it is anticipated that that action plan will be published very shortly uh, and then I would hope that we would have a debate on where we take matters from there. But we are very determined to make progress and the action plan will signpost the way forward to ensure uh, that we see uh, a far higher uh, percentage of uh, young disabled people being able to take up modern apprenticeships. Thank you very much. We now have to move to the next set of portfolio questions on social justice, communities and pensioners. Right. Question one, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much it is spending in 2015-16 to mitigate the UK Government's social security reforms. Minister Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government has provided £104.2 million pounds in 2015-16 to mitigate the worst effects of the UK Government's welfare cuts. This funding is part of a total £296.4 million provided across 2013 to 2016. Thanks. Cameron Stewart. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, with nearly £1 billion more cuts to come from welfare benefits every year from the UK Tory Government, mitigating against the full brunt of these cuts cannot be borne entirely by the Scottish Government. Will the Minister look at how we can seek to protect the most vulnerable and the poorest people in our society from these appalling austerity policies that are being inflicted on the people of Scotland? Minister. Uh, as I've outlined, the Scottish Government is providing significant mitigation resources but recognises that it's impossible to fully mitigate the cuts. But the Scottish Government will always do what we can to protect the poorest and the most vulnerable people in our society. But responsibility must lie with the UK government and, their unfair, and its unfair austerity agenda, which we will continue to oppose. We will do all that we can with the new powers coming to the Scottish Parliament to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. Thanks. Ken McIntosh. Thank you, President Officer. I uh, welcome the Minister's comments, as well as uh, mitigating the UK social security reforms. Will the government uh, promise to use the powers it already has, as well as those coming to help, for example, to help the disabled and elderly in Scotland? Uh, yesterday, the First Minister outlined her plans for legislation, a, a bill on social security in the coming year. Will the Minister undertake to use that bill to abolish the care tax in Scotland, powers it already has? Minister. The Scottish Government, as um, Ken McIntosh will be well aware, is currently having discussion with the stakeholders and the people of Scotland on how to take forward the new powers and also how to use some of the powers in terms of making things better for those uh, disabled and in social security. So we will continue with that discussion and will report back at the beginning of the year uh, and, how, and the outcome of the discussions and how we create a fairer Scotland to make, reduce inequalities across the country. Many thanks. Question two, Dave Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that enough is being done to tackle prejudice towards people with faith. Minister Mark Abiyaji. The Scottish Government is clear that there is no place in Scotland for any form of religious prejudice. Statistics published in June 2015 showed that the number of religiously aggravated crimes is at its lowest level since 2004-2005, but we are not complacent. Even one incident is too many. The First Minister is hosting an interfaith summit this month which will raise the profile of interfaith activity and recognise the importance of dialogue and building relationships between communities. The Scottish Government has provided funding of over £3.1 million to organisations working towards race and religious equality for 2015-16. and This includes £145,000 to Interfaith Scotland, which works across Scotland to develop and support interfaith relations and assist faith communities to engage with Civic Scotland. Thank you. Dave Thompson. I'm very pleased to hear that the Interfaith Summit is going to take place this month. That's a very positive uh, development. Uh, I wonder whether the Minister can tell me whether the summit will deal with religious freedom in its broadest sense and whether he is supportive of my proposal to set up a cross-party group on religious freedom or faith in the Parliament. Minister. The agenda for the Interfaith Summit has been set in partnership with the participants. Religious freedom is not an item on there per se, but it is certainly implicit 
in the subject matter that the summit will be dealing with. Uh, with regard to CPGs, the presiding officer will wish me to be clear that they are creatures of parliament, not government, but ministers are always keen to work constructively with CPGs, and we are always supportive of any efforts to highlight the important positive role that faith and belief can make in public life. Many thanks. Question three, Alex Johnston. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to use the additional welfare and employment support powers proposed in the Scotland Bill. Sorry, Alec Neil. Presiding officer, can I first of all congratulate you on your recent betrothal? I haven't had the opportunity to do that, and I'm sure everybody else in the House would want to do it. Can I say, as set out in our programme for government, we will take forward a comprehensive and ambitious programme to help deliver our commitment to reducing inequality and stimulating sustainable economic growth. We do not believe that, as drafted, the Scotland Bill delivers on the spirit or the letter of the Smith Agreement. We are continuing to negotiate with the UK Government to amend the Bill so that we have a fuller range of powers over welfare. In the meantime, we are consulting widely on what to do with the new powers, which is the right thing to do. But where we can, we already, we're already moving quickly to implement them, and we're already working with the Department for Work and Pensions on changes to how the universal credit is paid in Scotland, and we're developing an alternative to the DWP's contracted employment support programmes in Scotland that will be in place from April the 1st, 2017. Thank you, and thank you for your good wishes. Alex Johnson. I congratulate the Minister on the cheerful nature of the opening to his answer. However, it did go downhill as he carried on. I would like to ask the Minister if he will, at this stage, begin to flesh out the plans he has, not only in the sense that uh, the powers and how he would like to use them, but how he is likely to finance the changes that are coming forward. Because the clear impression is being given by this government that additional welfare powers will be used to distribute significant additional levels of support within Scotland. If this is the case, and some doubt it, then there will be a cost. Will this be financed through cuts in other services or increases in taxation using the powers that are coming his way? Presiding officer, as part of the overall package of implementing the Smith recommendations or less than the Smith recommendations in terms of the bill, uh, there has to be a fiscal framework agreed between the Scottish Government and the UK Government. And uh, it is part of that uh, discussion as to how we fund uh, welfare in the future uh, and whether um, we, do we want to make sure we don't end up in the same position as the UK government has put Northern Ireland, where they have been landed with responsibilities of £70 million which have not been funded by the Treasury or in any other way. So, therefore, the fiscal framework which is to be agreed between the two governments will answer the question that Mr Johnson puts. Many thanks. Question for Linda Fabiani. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights last met Citizens Advice Scotland and what was discussed. Presiding officer, I met with Margaret Lynn's Chief Executive of Citizens Advice Scotland on the 27th of May as part of the Scottish Leaders' Welfare Forum. Previously, I had met with Cass along with the Secretary of State for Scotland on the 11th of March after a meeting of the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare. At both meetings, I discussed progress to date with the Smith proposals, welfare mitigation, and how CAS might get involved in discussions around the new powers. Ms. Fabiani. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and ask him whether next time he meets with them he would discuss uh, CAS's view, uh, as published in August 2015, that some sections of the Scotland Bill as currently drafted do not appear to meet the intent of the Smith Agreement in relation to social security and tribunals. And is the Cabinet Secretary concerned that without changes being made to these draft clauses as they currently stand, there are clear risks of detriment to citizens' advice bureau clients right across the country? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with uh, what Linda Fabiani is saying, uh, presiding officer. And the cash response itself describes a concerning rise in the number of employment cases dealt with by Bureau in Scotland on pay and poor, often illegal workplace practices. Uh, the cash report highlights in particular the situation with employment tribunals, where it says that new fees introduced by the UK government have been causing problems for many people in low incomes who feel unable to challenge unfair treatment. 
But as the First Minister outlined yesterday in the programme for government, presiding officer, we intend to abolish these fees for tribunals and therefore make access to tribunals much fairer for employees as well as employers. Many thanks. Question five, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the recent admissions by the UK Government that it used fake quotes to promote its benefit sanctions regime in Scotland and across the UK. Minister Margaret Burgess. Um, sadly, this is unsurprising from the UK Government, who brought in this discredited sanctions system. We know the problems that the current sanctions regime is causing. It's clear the system isn't working, and no number of made-up PR cases case studies can demonstrate otherwise. It further highlights the failings that are in the whole system and the flawed approach of the UK government. That's why we believe the current regime should be suspended pending an urgent review. It's a discredited system which needs a complete overhaul and we support the House of Commons Work and Pensions Committee call for a full and independent review of the system. Thanks. George Adam. I thank the Minister for her response, but does she agree with me that the time uh, is, to, is now to end this sanction regime? Every MSP within this chamber will have his constituents in their offices telling horrendous tales brought about by these sanctions. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree? Oh, sorry, I'm promoting you there, Margaret. Does the Minister agree with me that we need a welfare reform programme that actually helps people into work instead of penalising people of being out of work? Mr. Um, absolutely agree uh, with the member because unfortunately I've heard a number of the, these tales in my own uh, constituency office and I'm sure there's not any member of this chamber who haven't had similar experiences. Uh, they're not isolated cases and, and that's what makes it so tragic. As I said in my previous answer, the current system is flawed. There should be an independent review of the entire system. And we firmly believe that the Scotland Bill doesn't go far enough and that all social security powers should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. It's clear that if we want a fair and effective social security system that treats people with dignity and supports people into work, then it should be in the hands of this Parliament. Many thanks. Question six, Margaret McCullough. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports town centre regeneration <coughs> in central Scotland. Absolutely. Presiding Officer, Scotland's Town Centre First Principle agreed with COSLA, together with the measures set out in the Town Centre Action Plan, set the conditions and underpin, underpin activity designed to tackle the key issues in town centres across Scotland. Local authorities remain responsible for local regeneration and local economic development. They are best placed to respond to local circumstances, working with their communities to develop the right vision for their town centres in partnership with the wider public, private and community sectors. Furthermore, in 2015-16, we are providing £1.7 million funding directly to local community organisations through the Town Centre Communities Capital Fund. Thanks. Margaret McCullough. Um, I thank the Minister for that answer. New Start, new start Rates so Relief is an important part of the Town Centre Action Plan designed to help businesses into vacant new build properties. The information I had to obtain through FOI showed that of Scotland's 32 councils, only six had granted New Start applications in the first two years of the scheme. What is the Government's view about the level of successful applications and do they share my concern that New Start isn't supporting regeneration in the way it should be? Hey, presiding officer, I think everything should be done to encourage New Start businesses as part of the regeneration strategy in all of our town centres. And can I particularly point out the work done by the Carnegie Trust, which in a number of towns up and down the length and breadth of the UK, they have actually worked with entrepreneurs, people who are setting up young people who are setting up new businesses, uh, and they have deliberately located these new businesses in vacant premises in town centres. And the Carnegie Trust reports a success rate of reaching 80% in terms of the survival and the expansion, expansion of these businesses. And that's a very, very good example of how we can use new businesses, and particularly the dynamism of young entrepreneurs as part and parcel of the overall solution to dealing with the developing our town centres and making them fit for the 21st century. Many thanks. Question seven, Patricia Ferguson. To ask the Scottish Government what processes communities should follow to apply for funding from the Town Centre Communities Capital Fund. 
Presiding Officer, communities can access details and full guidance about the Town Centre Communities Capital Fund on the Scottish Government website. The fund is open to community organisations to support capital projects in town centres across Scotland and the deadline for applications is the 29th of September 2015. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Um, he will be aware of my interest in town centre regeneration and my support for the previous scheme that the um, Scottish Government brought forward. And while the funding for this scheme is of course welcome, I do worry that the amount of money available will be oversubscribed, as was the case the last time. Um, but I wonder if he could perhaps give some more information today about the type of criteria that will be used in order to judge these applications and to make awards of money. Absolutely. Hey, presiding officer, can I first of all say that, of course, this 1.7 million uh, fund is not the only fund available for town centre re renovation. If you uh, may remember, over the last month, we've also announced a £4 million pounds fund specifically tailored to bringing a disused property in our town centres into use for the purposes of providing housing uh, and flatted uh, and other types of accommodation. In terms of the criteria, can I say the main issue here is that it has to be capital spend and the money has to be committed by the end of March 2016. It doesn't necessarily have to be spent by then, but it has to be committed under Treasury rules by then. In terms of the more detailed criteria, uh, the member will be able to access those on the website because I wouldn't have time here to go through those at the present time. Many thanks. Briefly, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the Town Centre Communities Capital Fund encourage transport-based projects which will boost town centres? Okay, Presiding Officer, where an appropriate uh, application comes forward, in principle, there's no reason why a transport project could not be supported, provided it is in relation to capital expenditure and it is clearly part and parcel of a down, town centre regeneration plan. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. John Pentland, question eight. To encourage developers to build housing on brownfield sites rather than bring forward plans for using agricultural or greenbelt land. Minister Margaret Burgess. Scottish planning policy requires that development plans promote sustainable development and consider the reuse or redevelopment of brownfield land over greenfield sites. John Penland. My constituency currently has a housing proposal on greenbelt that, that will turn a village into a suburb of a town. We do need more private and social housing, but there are several potential brownfield sites that, that are not being developed. Will the Minister consider what else can be done to encourage brownfield development? Minister. Clearly, as a member will be aware, it's up to local authorities in their local development plan how they zone uh, the land for housing development. Um, what we do say in the guidelines is that they should look at brownfield sites um, first, but it is up to local authorities how they zone their land for housing development. Many thanks. Gil Patterson. Similar question, uh, President Officer. The Minister will be aware that there are many brownfield sites in the constituency that, that I represent in Clayback Mulgay. Just wonder what can be done to release these, uh, encourage the owners to release these brownfield sites uh, for development. Minister. I think the member raises a good point there, but brownfield sites may often have added complications which could delay their release for development. The Scottish Government and local authorities are working with the private sector across Scotland to find solutions to the challenges being faced. And I know that progress, for example, in Western Bartonshire Council to secure infrastructure investment to make significant brownfield sites in Clyde Bank, such as the Queen's Quay, uh, more readily available for development. So the progress has started, but we're still some way to go. Thank you. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a Central Scotland MSP, can I echo the concerns raised by John Pentland regarding Greenbelt development in this area? And can I ask the Scottish Government how many green brownfield sites have been redeveloped since 2007? Minister. What I can say to the member is that the 2014 Scottish Vacant and Derelict Land Survey showed that 319 hectares, 250 sites of derelict and urban vacant land were reclaimed since the previous survey in 2013. 30% of derelict land and 54% and of urban vacant land, land was reclaimed for housing. Many thanks. Uh, very briefly, Cameron McCannon. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to increase support for local participation and decision making in planning applications outside of the local development plans. Presenting officer, through changes in planning legislation, opportunities are available for everyone to engage in the development decisions which affect them. We continue to support people's engagement in the planning system through the Charette mainstreaming programme and core grant funding for planning aid for Scotland. Briefly, Cameron McCannon. Ask the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice when he last met. Sorry, you don't, I, haven't got a, I haven't got a supplementary. Thank you. Hey, thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions for this afternoon. My apologies to those questioners I have not been able to take. We now move to the next item of business, which is the continuation of the debate.